Um, so normally I give like really deep technical presentations, but given this is the theory and practice of blockchains, I thought it might be more interesting to talk about, you know, going from theory to practice. You know, what is it like trying to transition from doing deep research to building something that people will actually use? And what is the lessons we've learned over the past year of doing that? Uh, no one ever likes to talk about the negatives, but I'm going to try to focus on the negatives during this talk, because I think that's probably where you're going to learn the most lessons. Um, yeah, awesome. So the, in July 2019, I'd quit my assistant professorship at King's College London. Originally, I only wanted to go 20% and uh, you know, try to do both at the same time. But after a long discussion, we thought it was actually best I just focus full time on the startup. You know, trying to you know, be a professor and do a BSc, it was um, it's too much work for one person to do, really. I don't know how other people do it. So when we left, there was four of us. There was myself, it was Chris Buckland, he's a senior engineer. There's uh, Salvatore, who's also a senior engineer, and there's Sergi, who was a postdoc at UCL. And we all left the university at roughly the same time. And, you know, what did we actually decide to pursue? What, were we, what, were we, what did we focus on for our startup? You know, Bitcoin supports seven transactions per second, and Ethereum supports 12 transactions per second. And if we're going to build, you know, a global financial system, it's not going to run on this base layer, you know, layer one. So over the past few years, Oh yeah, over the past few years, what I've been really excited for are off-chain protocols. And I still believe in the coming year or two, this is how most people will interact with Bitcoin or Ethereum. And it's built up of three main components. So the first one is this peer-to-peer -peer routing network. Anyone in the world will be able to join this, you know, payment to join this routing network. I put up collateral and I facilitate, you know, transfer of value across the world. So that's basically the Lightning Network today. You know, I can open a channel, I put in $100, and then people can send coins across that route. Then the next one are these non-custodial hubs. So this time last year was mostly focused around Plasma, and now it's mostly focused around Rollup. So what's really exciting about these non-custodial hubs is that they're designed, so one or several operators, their only job is to listen for off-chain transactions, create a block, compress all the transactions in the block, and periodically checkpoint that on, you know, on layer one, Ethereum or Bitcoin. So that's really exciting. Uh, you can imagine that most online services in the future will have some type of plasma or rollup. And in the middle, there'll be this routing network so I can send coins from, I don't know, Arena of Valor to RuneScape, for example. And in the middle of all of this, there's this uh, watching network. So the idea is that there's these watchers who look at the Ethereum or Bitcoin blockchain, they look at what these operators are doing, and they try to hold them all accountable. If anyone cheats, they watch out for it, they respond and they slash and penalize them for that. And of course you have the layer one blockchain that's no longer used for all transactions. So that's sort of like the layer two vision in a very concise nutshell. You know, normally you need a bit more time to, to fully appreciate it. And around last year, you could see this starting to evolve. So you have all these companies in the middle, like Lightning, Raiden, L4, Canax, Blockstream, Eternity. They were all focusing on Interledger, all focusing on building this peer-to-peer -peer routing layer. Um, I think they're starting to realize that it is a routing layer and it's not a payment layer. And on the, on the outliers, you have you know, Starkware, Fuel, Off-Chain Labs, with Arbitrum. They're building these non-custodial hubs where anyone could run a hub, they could facilitate these off-chain transactions. So for our startup, we thought, well, why don't we position ourselves as the watchtowers? You know, we knew how to build watchtowers, why don't we go do it? And that's basically what we decided. And when we tried to pitch the idea of Pisa, we would normally say, you know, Pisa is this watch and, you know, watch and protect solution. Alice and Bob are doing payments. Alice goes offline. Bob tries to cheat. Yes, yeah, so as you can see there, you know, the, the different companies that are evolving to do this. And that's sort of at a conceptual level what they're building. So then what we decided to build was this Bitcoin and Ethereum watchtower. So we wanted to build a watchtower for each network. Because Sergi's, you know, an expert at Bitcoin. I know a bit of both. And uh, Chris is good at Ethereum. So we thought, let's go attack both of these watchtowers at the same time. Oh, my laptop is so slow. Yeah, I think there's like the perfect case of uh, everything blowing up at the same time. So I think what was interesting though is, yeah, so at a high level, how does this work? Okay. So when we're building the Watts Tower, we really cared about three different properties. You know, we wanted to be non-custodial. So we wanted to build a Watts Tower that never had access to any one primary funds. Two, we wanted to be publicly verifiable. So if we didn't do our job and we didn't provide a quality of service, then anyone can prove that we didn't do our job. 
And finally, we want to be financially accountable. So if we don't provide a quality of service, we have a security deposit locked up. And if you can prove we didn't do our job, you could, you know, submit evidence where they enforce to compensate you or we get slashed. So, you know, so we're financially accountable to our service and to our customers. And at a high level, it's really simple. You have Alice and Bob, or I mean, sorry, you have the user in the watchtower. The user will send the watchtower this pre-signed transaction. And the watchtower will respond with a signed receipt to say, yep, I've accepted the job. And then what you have on the blockchain is a smart contract with our security deposit. That's the PISA contract. And then you also have this on-chain evidence of whatever we had to protect. So for a payment channel, it would be challenge initiated, we responded to the challenge, and the channel closed. So there's on-chain evidence that we did our job. And so what PISA really was guaranteeing in the end was that if event X happens on the blockchain, we guarantee the post condition Y will be satisfied. That's basically at a very generic level what we were trying to guarantee. So how did that come along anyway? So we decided to pursue this from July to December. You know, what was the uptake like? So on the Bitcoin world, we presented a skilling Bitcoin, we presented the Lightning Conference, we worked on a standard. So if we're building a watchtower, we need to have a standard so anyone connect, can connect to our watchtower. You know, they, any Lightning node or wallet, and we call this Bolt 13 and we released this publicly. And there was actually a lot of community engagement around the idea of using a watchtower and our project. And the Bitcoin one, at a high level, the way it works is that the user encrypts a blob, they encrypt a transaction, they give us an encrypted blog, they give us a transaction ID, we give back the signed receipt, and all we have to do is watch the Bitcoin blockchain for a transaction ID. If this transaction ID appears, we can extract the decryption key, we decrypt, and we publish their, you know, their transaction. It's a very simple design overall at how that works. Um, and of course, the holders accountable is that you have the signed receipt and you can look at the blockchain to see if we actually responded to that dispute. So it's really easy to prove that we didn't do our job, you know, given the signed receipt and the on-chain evidence. So that all sounds pretty simple. And actually the implementation was pretty simple. Our only dependency was Bitcoin Core. It was actually a really nice tight-knit, you know, implementation. Um, but it doesn't come for free. You know, Bitcoin itself made our you know, the design actually really complicated. For one, we can't bump the fee. So if you give us a pre-signed transaction and the fee set is $1, but the network fee skyrocket to $20, we can't actually get the transaction in for you. So there's no way for us to actually provide a quality of service if the network fees are volatile. And they always are volatile, so that's really frustrating. Two, there's order and storage. So if you do 1,000 payments in a Lightning channel, we have to store 999 encrypted blobs. So from a storage perspective, it doesn't scale very well. And finally, we can't be financially accountable. We can only be, you know, with our reputation. There's no way to do any slashing conditions on Bitcoin whatsoever. I mean, I guess you'll find out next how to do it to serve us. But if you want to, you know, have a simple watchtower implementation, you can't do that in a straightforward manner. So um, it's actually a really classic example where and people always say, oh, Bitcoin's really simple. The script's really simple. Does value transfers. Well, that's because Axie is a bit of a Frankenstein system in two. It pushes all the complexity to the second layer. So all the complexity is actually in the watchtower and designing around the imperfection of Bitcoin. And it's the most frustrating thing ever to have to build on top of. Um, I'm quite publicly open about that. You know, it's non-trivial to actually build a watchtower for uh, Lightning. So what about the uptake? You know, how many people wanted to pay for the, the service? And I have this little tumbleweed here, as I hope you can see. Um, you can see the screen okay, can't you? You can see the, the slides. Yeah, okay, cool. So there's a tumbleweed here because we spoke to a lot of companies throughout that time and no lightning company actually ever wanted to pay for, um, for a watchtower. So we were just way too early with that. So that's the current, that was the currency of the Bitcoin watchtower at that time. So then we started working on the Ethereum Watchtower concurrently. Um, I just want to confirm, can you guys see the slide okay? Not if you can see the slide. Yeah, okay, cool. Because this is yeah. uh, the little sharing screens on the wrong window. Cool. So for the Ethereum Watchtower, um, I mean, the PISA was always designed for Ethereum anyway. So it should just work out of the box. Again, we have the PISA contract that has the deposit. 
And then you'd have like the state channel contract that could produce the on-chain evidence. So how do we generate that on-chain evidence? The way, the easiest way to do it is that in Ethereum, what you could have is you look at the block, you look at the transaction, you get the receipt, and it will say if an event happened there or not. So there's a very easy way to do that using an SPV proof. Unfortunately, taking that proof and sending it to another smart contract is not doable in a trivial manner because the EVM doesn't really support that. Uh, it's missing one, one opcode could be extended and that would work out of the box. But that's really frustrating. It was actually really difficult for us for the PISA contract to verify that a, a, an event happened in a different smart contract, you know, without any intrusive changes. So we thought, well, to get around that problem, why don't we just um, tell the state channel contract, well, if you create an on-chain log, then you can use the PISA service. But if you're building a startup and you're expecting other smart contracts to modify how they work and redeploy that smart contract to use your service, then it's a chicken and an egg problem. You know, they have to actually value, value what you're doing before they're willing to modify their contract. So from a startup perspective, that's, you know, that's not going to work from the onset. Other problems we had with the Ethereum stuff was um, we also tried to over constrain ourselves. You know, we, we actually set it up so that we'll only relay a transaction of a precondition and a post condition can be satisfied. And that actually complicated our API. So because we tried to make the most trustless service possible, it actually made it really difficult to use the service. And obviously that's going to entail any adoption you get if people can't easily pick it up and use it. Um, and then over that period of time as well, we started to realize, well, all PEAS is doing is watching for an on-chain event and then responding. That isn't just off-chain. That could work for any smart contract out there. You know, if you're doing like an auction, for example, we could respond to an auction once the auction period has started. So it's actually useful for any smart contracts, not just useful for um, off-chain protocols. And finally, the hardest thing about building a watchtower isn't the watchtower itself. It's actually just building a relayer that can reliably send transactions. Because in Ethereum, there's lots of pitfalls of sending transactions. So one, if, this, you know, if the fees skyrocket, then your transaction, the fee may not be good enough, and it gets dropped from the network. If your transaction gets dropped, then you have to republish that transaction to the network. So that's one problem. You know, we have to periodically republish transactions if the fee isn't good enough. Two, transaction queue can get stuck. What I mean there is that in Ethereum, miners are not very smart. If you have like five transactions, the first one pays through 10 GUE, the next ones pay 100 GUE, because the first transaction pays a low fee, none of them get in. You know, they don't do very good BIM packing whatsoever. So now you've got to make sure all the transaction fees are ordered, you know, from high to low. And finally, uh, fees are volatile, you know, they go up and down like this. You need to make sure your relayer can actually you know, submit at a certain price and gradually bump the fee to outcompete everyone else. And these sound like trivial problems, but actually this is really awkward to work with. There's also some other Ethereum network rules that make it difficult. So now we're at December 2019. You know, what have we learned as a team so far? We learned that, you know, Bitcoin itself made building watchtowers really awkward. You know, Bitcoin could easily be improved to fix that problem. Two, no one wanted to pay for watchtowers. So we have this really cool software well, if it's really good community engagement, people are really interested in the project, but no one wants to pay to actually run a, you know, a watchtower service. Uh, so we don't want to abandon the project because it's not profitable, because it is a really important cornerstone of Lightning. And on the Ethereum side, you know, generating the, the evidence on chain is too hard because Ethereum couldn't support that very well. We took non-custodial way too far. Relay and not watching is the real challenge. And actually our market is way beyond off-chain protocols. So, you know, 2020 gave us pandemic, lockdowns, protests, and a new beginning for our team. So how did that turn out? So the first one is that we took the Watchtower project and we put in a separate entity called Talaya Labs, which is this free open source project. We got in touch with Square Crypto and they actually funded the project for us, which is really great. So Sergi now has full time, you know, he has a year's funding to work on this Watchtower exclusively. And now it's integrated to see Lightning as well. So while it's not going to make any money in the short term, you know, there's a huge interest in this watchtower and it's actually really important to let people, you know, Sergi continue to build it and Square Crypto recognize that. So that's really exciting. We did a major rebrand of PISA 
So one problem we had when pitching the companies or even VCs, we would say, okay, we're building this watchtower, uh, but it works for, we're, we're building this watchtower and it works for any smart contract. But when they hear watchtower Pisa, they think of layer two, they think of off chain. And for them, they didn't really understand that it worked for every smart contract because of their own preconception. And that's a huge problem to do any marketing or even if you read any papers. You need to make sure your message is very clear what they associate it with. So we rebranded to any.sender. Any dot is a twist of message.sender and any, because we really want to highlight that it works for any smart contract. And actually what we, if you actually position it as what we're building, it's, much, it's actually a really cool idea. So any project out there can plug in the, our API and our API is non-custodial infrastructure. So they send us the transaction, we take it, we gradually bump the fee and we get it in. All we do is relay pre-signed transactions, but we never have access to their primary funds. And this is actually a really cool service in the sense that, you know, you don't have to trust us with your money and we can actually provide you a service that, you know, deals with your primary funds. And what we really focused on solving was, you know, republishing transactions periodically, has fee first and real time fee adjustment, those problems that I mentioned before. And we're still financially accountable. We just took a different twist on the idea. So instead of trying to guarantee a post condition, we say, we promise we get this transaction in the blockchain by block 400. You know, we have 400 blocks to get it in. And the way we create the on-chain evidence is that all the transactions go via our own contract and then they jump out. So we can always produce that on-chain evidence to hold us accountable. So that's actually really cool. And the service again is non-custodial, but we constrained ourselves last. You know, we don't deal with preconditions. We don't deal with post conditions. We never have access to the primary funds and we just deal with these pre-signed transactions. So it's like a small twist on the original idea, but it's actually quite clear of why it's more useful and actually way easier for people to adopt. Um, and are all the technical problems solved? Um, oh, sorry, I'm just going to be two more minutes and then I can, I can take questions in the chat room if you want. Um, I don't want to go over my time. Are all, all the technical problems solved from our end? Unfortunately not. There's this thing called the message.sender problem in Ethereum that plagues anyone who wants to build relay infrastructure. Uh, I have a video about it and there's also this blog post on uh, E3 Search where people are talking about several proposals, how to fix it. For us, as long as you use a wallet contract, then it's not that big an issue. You know, we launched with this cool BLS competition, but I wouldn't talk about it much. What we've really been focusing on is getting the client tooling really simple, so it's really easy to adopt. So what we learned last year was that we made the protocol too complicated, made the API too complicated. So from those lessons, we went over and thought, well, let's make it as easy as possible to use. And um, we also hacked MetaMask with this thing called Black Tie, which is a Pomeranian to demonstrate how it works. And after the year, we finally got some adoption. So this is uh, someone sent this transaction through the Any.Sender service. You know, hello from Ptokens Core, this message is sent from Any.Sender. So over the year, we finally got someone to use the service, which for us is um, finally an accomplishment. So as I started the presentation with, last year, this is how I thought Pisa would fit into the wider ecosystem, you know, all these off-chain protocols. But in reality, once, you, once we understood the problem we were solving and we actually understood you know, where this product would like, fit in the map, it's really just, you have you know, Ethereum, you have a middleware that deals with interacting with Ethereum, then all the other services that want to send transactions. So it's actually where AnyDot fits in. So we were actually just looking at a small, pic, you know, a small sample of the picture. And it took us six months to realize, oh wait, we're actually used for all these other products. So um, what I just want to finish up with is, um, some of the lessons we learned from research that can help prepare you for this. So when you write a paper, you normally rewrite your introduction a hundred times. You know, you normally re you write your, you write the protocol, you write the intro, you work out there's a problem, you sit, fix it, you reposition the problem, you reframe the problem. And you do that several times until you have the, you know, the paper finished. This is basically what we did with our startup. You know, we were doing X and we ended up with Y. Um, minimalist approach, just like writing a paper, you only have three or four contributions. You can't solve the world. Exactly what we're trying to do with Any.Sender. We're only trying to solve relaying transactions and watching for events. Peer review, this is customer feedback. So a peer review, you submit a paper, you wait three months, you get a paragraph back, and then you get reviewer B, you hit your idea. Customer feedback's the same, except you get it immediately. 
either someone gives you feedback because they like it or they never reply. Um, so it's a very similar process. Um, just like a PhD, early PhD students get a bit fed up because they're working on a paper for six months to two years. And, you know, it's just like this, this anchor on them that just stays with them for two years. And it's really easy to give up. But it's also, is it, but it's also harder to stick to it and keep going. And you get that exact same feeling in the startup where you just feel lost for like six months until you realize what you're doing. And as a process of learning, the more you do it, the faster you get. Um, and one other point is, it's also important to focus on your work. So just like, you know, research, sometimes there's this tendency to try to get a one up on someone where you say, well, I'm doing X and it's way better than this because of all these features. But actually you're just better off working on your um, product and trying to build it in making sure your contributions are you know, concrete. Because at the end of the day, for research, it depends on your citations and how people perceive it. For companies, it depends on who is actually willing to adopt it. Um, this is my final slide here. Um, sorry for the rush. Um, one thing I've realized is that research and entrepreneurship are very similar skill sets. So in research, you, know, you write a paper, there tends to be an insight. You got this rough idea of what you want to work on. Then it goes like, it's a bit like this and you're going up and down, up and down, trying to scope out exactly the problem you're going to solve. You found the problem, you work on the solution. Uh, you build a team of authors to help you solve that problem. And then you hack away until you solve the problem. Eventually you pitch it, you submit the peer review, it gets rejected. You know, you reframe the problem, you rewrite your intro, you submit it again, it keeps getting rejected and eventually gets you accepted. And entrepreneurship is very similar. You get this insight that there's a problem. Um, you define the problem, you build a straw man solution. Again, you build a team. Startups tend to have no money, so you're trying to convince other people to work on your idea with you. Um, you hack away, you pitch. If no one adopts your software, if no one invests in the idea, then you, you go back to the drawing board, you rewrite that intro again, and you keep going until eventually someone uses the software. So the real difference I think I've taken away from this is that research focuses on the exploration of new ideas. You know, your whole task is to explore new ideas and you know, expand the field. Where for a startup, it's more about the deployment of new ideas. So it's more about trying to get people to think it's useful and pay for it and use it. But it still needs to be a new idea. You know, if you just build another coffee shop, you're not gonna to go to the moon building another coffee shop. It needs to be something that actually solves a real problem. Um, so that's my last slide. I apologize for the rush and my, my laptop crashed. That's a bit embarrassing. <laughs>